G'day folks, welcome to my channel. In this video, I want to talk about the subject of the spiritual gifts. Recently, I did a, a poll on my YouTube community page asking people how many of them believed that the spiritual gifts, the miraculous gifts, had ceased and what scripture uh, verses they would use to support their perspective. 19% of people said that the spiritual gifts had ceased 66 said that they had not ceased, and the rest said that they weren't sure. And the number one argument that I came across again and again was that the purpose of the spiritual gifts, the sole purpose, was to authenticate the apostles and their message. And they said that the only people that exercised the spiritual gifts, the miraculous ones, were the apostles or their very close associates. Now I want to address this argument in this video. There's many other arguments that cessationists use, but this is the argument that I want to address with the Word of God in this video. And I want to show you that the scriptures clearly teach us and show us that not only were the miraculous gifts not limited to the apostles and their very close associates, but the miraculous gifts, including prophecy, were exercised by ordinary believers all throughout the New Testament church. Now, I want to make it very clear right at the beginning of this video that this is not a salvation issue. There are good godly believers on both sides of this debate. And the purpose of this video is not to put anyone down or to attack anyone, but instead the purpose of this video is to show you through the Word of God, that the gifts of the Spirit were exercised by ordinary believers all throughout the New Testament church. And the very first verse that I want to look at is in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 16, and it says this, But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days it shall be, says God, that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my men servants and maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. Now, the first point I want to make from this verse is that all of the apostles were men. Paul and the other 12 apostles were all men. Yet this passage clearly says that women would prophesy, your sons and daughters, your men servants and maid servants. So clearly prophecy cannot be limited to the apostles because women are, are said to have prophesied in the last days. Very clear. The second point I want to make from this text is that some people think that if you prophesy, then it must be recorded in Scripture. Yet, when you look at the New Testament, outside of the Gospels, there is not a single record of a prophecy coming from a woman. So the New Testament did not have this belief that uh, every prophecy needed to be written down and recorded in Scripture. So, so that's the second point that I want to make. The third point that I want to make is this. Prophecy here in this passage is not referring to preaching and teaching because it's very clear that the prophecy is the result of the dreams and visions. It's a result of having a revelation from God. They're the three points that I want to make from this scripture. Now, the next scripture I want to look at is in Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6, and this, of course, is Stephen, one of the deacons of the church in Jerusalem. And it says this in Acts 6, verse 8. It says this, Now Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Now, of course, Stephen was not an apostle. He was a deacon, and yet he did many mighty works. He did signs and wonders. In addition to that, you have the prophet Agabus, who prophesied that there would be a great famine in Jerusalem. He also prophesied that the apostle Paul would be bound in Jerusalem and handed over to the Gentiles. In addition to that, you have Philip. Philip was another deacon, and he went to Samaria, preached the gospel, 
cast out demons and he also healed the paralyzed and the lame and there was great joy in the city the bible says in addition to that you have uh, philip's four daughters uh, they uh, were prophets according to the scriptures four virgin daughters who were prophets uh, and it's interesting to note there that uh, none of their prophecies are recorded in Scripture. So the argument that we have to record prophecy and include it in the canon of Scripture uh, cannot be accepted because we have no record of their prophecies. In addition to that, you have in 1 Corinthians 11, uh, where the Apostle Paul says that women can pray and prophesy with their head covered. That's, that's a fascinating passage of Scripture because now you have ordinary women in the church who are able to prophesy. In fact, let's look at that verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning at verse 2, and it says this, I praise you, brothers, that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions as I delivered them to you. But I would have you know that the head of the woman is the man. The head of every man is Christ and the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. For that is the same as if she were shaved. Now, there's three very important points I want to make from this passage of Scripture. First of all, it's very clear here that ordinary men and women who had the gift of prophecy could indeed prophesy in the church if they followed the relevant rules. That is, the women had to have their heads covered as a sign of submission and the men had to leave their heads uncovered. Secondly, prophecy here cannot refer to preaching and teaching because the Bible is very clear that a woman cannot teach a man. And since a church service is made of both men and women, it cannot refer to preaching and teaching because women are not permitted in Scripture to do so. Thirdly, this is a mixed service. This is a service with both men and women. We know that because the whole point of a woman praying and prophesying with her head covered is to indicate her submission to her husband and the leadership of the church. Very, very clear points here that I think clearly prove that the miraculous gifts were not limited to the apostles or their close associates. Another passage, very interesting passage, and I want to make a very strong point from this passage, is in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, a couple of chapters later, it says this, Follow after love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. Now think about this passage for a moment. Paul is encouraging all of the Corinthians, not just uh, those that are close to the apostles. Paul is encouraging all of the Corinthians to desire the spiritual gifts. And we know just a few chapters earlier that the apostle Paul listed the spiritual gifts and included miracles, signs and wonders and healing and prophecy. And he says, follow after love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. Paul is here encouraging ordinary believers not only to seek for the spiritual gifts, but also that they may prophesy. Now, for those people who think that prophecy always has to be something recorded and included in the canon of Scripture, you have to ask yourself, why is it that no record of any woman prophesying outside of the Gospels is found in the New Testament? And why is it that there's no, it, not even a hint of an attempt to record and collect prophecies spoken by prophets? Not even a hint. But it's very clear here that Paul is encouraging all of the Corinthians, ordinary believers, to seek the spiritual gifts, especially that they may prophesy. I mean, I just simply don't know how you can really get around that. I mean, I mean, what are we supposed to say that he's encouraging if we're going to say that all of uh, all prophecy has to be recorded as scripture, as the uh, uh, inscripturated word of God? I mean, we would have to accept that Paul is telling everyone that they... Uh, should seek to write scripture or prophesy speak scripture to me that's just 
silly. I mean, it's, it's just not a very good argument at all. Now, let's look down at verse 26 of this passage. Verse 26, it says this, How is it then, brothers, when you come together, every one of you has a psalm, a teaching, a tongue, a revelation? Very important here. This is referring to someone receiving a revelation from the Holy Spirit. How is it then, brothers, when you come together, every one of you has a psalm, a teaching, a tongue, a revelation, and an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. Now, Paul is not saying that these people should not have a psalm, that they should not have a teaching, or that they should not have a tongue, or a revelation, or an interpretation. Paul is not condemning any of that. But what he is saying is that these things should be done uh, decently and in order for edification, that they should be done in a manner that is appropriate during a church service. So it's possible for ordinary church members to receive a revelation from the Holy Spirit during the service. Now, let's look a few verses down at verse 29. Let me read this to you. Let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge. If anything is revealed to another that sits by, let the first keep silent. For you may all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be encouraged. Now, first of all, when it says all here, it's not referring to all the church members. It's referring to all those who have received the gift of prophecy, all of those who are prophets. Yes, he encourages them all to seek the gift of prophecy, but obviously not everyone will be given the gift of prophecy because that is something that the Holy Spirit determines himself. And it's very clear here, all means all the prophets here. Now, the other thing is this. It says that let two or three speak and let the others judge. And then it says, if anything is revealed to another that sits by. This, I think, is the distinguishing mark between preaching and teaching and prophecy. Preaching and teaching is based upon the text of Scripture, but prophecy is based on a revelation from the Holy Spirit. Now, of course, when we look at Revelation, uh, I'm looking, thinking of examples like Agabus, where he speaks about a famine that will take place, and he prophesies Paul being imprisoned when he's in Jerusalem, and things like that. Prophecy is not necessarily uh, basically something to override the Word of God or to replace the Word of God. Uh, prophecy doesn't uh, bring the Word of God into disrepute in the sense that uh, the Word of God is insufficient to instruct us. But there are certain things that the Word of God does not tell us. And prophecy, uh, I think, is something that can be used to help us and to encourage us and edify us in these other areas. For example, God may be calling someone to be a street evangelist. God may be calling someone to be a missionary. And the Bible doesn't explicitly say whether or not I should be a missionary to Africa. But a prophet may very well come along and have something revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that encourages a believer to do something that perhaps they're already feeling led to do. And so therefore the gift of prophecy comes in to strengthen uh, that uh, leading and prompting in the individual believer's life. Now, another passage of scripture I want to look at is Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verse 6, and it says this, We have diverse gifts according to the grace that has been given us, if prophecy according to the proportion of faith, if service in serving, he who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with generosity, he who rules with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. This passage of scripture is very clear again, that ordinary believers could prophesy if they had that gift. Another passage, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning at verse 20. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning at verse 19, it says this, Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Examine all things. Firmly hold on to what is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil. It's very clear here that we are told, by the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, not to despise prophecy. To despise prophecy is to quench the Holy Spirit. Let me show you another passage. Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. 
beginning at verse 5, and of course the context of this passage is the discussion of salvation by faith apart from works. But Paul makes an interesting point in verse 5. He says this, Does God give you the Spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? What this verse tells us is that the, the, the gifts of the Spirit, the miraculous gifts of the Spirit, were not just limited to the apostles and their close associates. They weren't just limited to the church in Corinth, which Paul said did not come short in any spiritual gift. They weren't just limited to the church in Rome or the church in Thessalonica. All of these churches, as we've already seen, saw the miraculous gifts of the Spirit being exercised, but also here the church of Galatia also exercised the miraculous gifts uh, among themselves. Ordinary Believers, And of course, we, we know in the book of Revelation, we see the two witnesses who prophesy for three and a half years. Now, I'm going to continue tackling this subject of the spiritual gifts and cessationism and continuationism. And uh, I encourage you, leave some comments again. This is not a salvation issue. This is a discussion between believers. And there are good godly Christians on both sides of this debate. And I'll be completely honest with you. I am not one to settle for the fake. And I'll be honest with you, I have not seen the miraculous gifts being exercised. I've not seen anyone give a genuine prophecy. I mean, it's easy for us to convince ourselves that these things are happening. It's easy for us to say, oh, this person was healed, that person was healed. But in reality, they weren't. I want to seek for the real gifts. I don't want to settle for the fake. I want to seek the real gifts. And if God doesn't want to give them, then that's up to him. Uh, but um, I'm going to continue tackling this subject. And um, I want to encourage you to leave your comments in the comments section and to engage with me there and engage with others there. Of course, I can't always get to every comment, but I encourage you engage in this discussion. This is a good, healthy discussion for us to have as Christians. I hope you've liked this video. If you have, please consider subscribing. Give me a thumbs up. Hit the bell notification button. Leave a comment in the comment section. I'll see you in the comment section and you'll see me in my next video.